starting this workshop and please give us some time to launch it on YouTube. As you know, we'll be able to be followed from the UNITAR YouTube channel as well as our UNITAR slash NY slash live website. I will leave it on the chat and we'll be live in just two minutes. Great. We are uh, live now on YouTube. Our participants have joined. Uh, I wish you an amazing workshop and I hope all the participants enjoy. I pass the floor now to Nicolas Settler. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to all, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening. My name is Nicolas Settler. I am the executive director of the Geneva Science Policy Interface a platform that facilitates uh, science policy collaborations and engagement uh, in the context of international uh, Geneva. I will be your moderator for this session on fostering evidence-based decision-making for sustainable and just COVID recovery and transformative SDG implementation. We all know that to build back better and wiser after COVID, and to get us back on track with the SDGs, we will need solid evidence uh, to measure the progress we are achieving and to take robust and decisive uh, decisions. In some areas, data is lacking. In other areas, data is overwhelming. In all cases, we need tools to turn available data and evidence into useful information. We have today a fantastic lineup of organizations and speakers who will showcase very practical tools, resources, and knowledge platforms that should hopefully inspire you with creative ways to use evidence in policy programs and to support decision-making in the face of complexity and uncertainty. Before I hand over to our speakers, a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, the session uh, will be recorded and it is live streamed uh, right now on YouTube. Um, in terms of uh, those joining in Zoom, uh, there is a general, uh, general chat box uh, that uh, you can see on the bottom of your screen. Uh, this is something that we encourage you to use for general comments and information sharing. In addition to that, there is a Q&A function uh, in Zoom as well, uh, and that's where we really encourage you to ask specific questions related to the, the presentations. Uh, we have quite uh, limited time today and a, a lot of presentations, uh, so we hope we'll be able to respond to some of your questions uh, live, but otherwise uh, all the experts on the panel will uh, make their utmost to respond directly to your questions in uh, the Q&A interface. Lastly, before we start, uh, I'd like to recognize and also thank all the partners who contributed to shape this session. And if you allow me, I'd like to mention them. That's the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the World ben Benchmarking Alliance, UNOSAT, the UK Space Agency, the Geneva Science Policy Interface, the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance, the UN Global Compact, the Danish Institute for Human Rights, Women's Major Group, Femnet, Unrist, Global Reporting Initiative, and UNCTAD as well. So thanks to you all for contributing to that session. And without further ado, uh, we can start. Let's start with the first part of the session, which will feature actually three panels around tools and resources for evidence-based de decision-making. And the first panel will focus on initiatives to expand measurements of GDP and wealth in a way that can be used to prioritize post-COVID recovery and contribute to the SDGs. To learn more about this approach, uh, let me first introduce uh, Livia Bizikova, Lead of Governance and Monitoring at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD. Uh, Livia, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, 
we are happy to have the opportunity to to talk about our approach and my presentation is a shared presentation with Matthew uh, Agarwala from the Bennett Institute at, in Cambridge. So our main focus is, and as uh, Nicholas already mentioned, now we are focusing on uh, post-COVID recovery and planning. And one of the key challenges is that we've been hearing more and more as this discussion started. First, it was really focused on um, you know, that we should really focus on addressing climate crisis and, and issues related to climate change. Then there was the usual rhetoric that we have an important ch chance to basically have a stimulus to use it wisely. And many countries, for example, IMBs in Ottawa, Canada, so for example, the Canadian Recovery Strategy has a subtitle that talks about reimagining prosperity for all Canadians. And there has been more and more these type of strategies emphasizing the importance for, of uh, sustainable recovery. In the same time, we are already also seeing that as the amounts of uh, COVID-related impacts are increasing and we are seeing the second waves and the third waves, um, there is a lot more worry about the declining GDP or the declining growth in GDP. And there's also much more push um, to basically rebuild the GDP growth almost at any cost. So now the question is how we can think about a sustainable recovery and what it even means to think about sustainable recovery and how we can plan such a thing. So one thing in order to kind of start moving towards such a sustainable recovery is uh, becoming clear from a number of literature sources, but I just listed the latest ones, the Daskupta review published this year, that basically stated that while GDP is a good in terms of a short-term macroeconomic analysis and management, is definitely the, not the measure to be used for assessing the sustainability of economic pathway, and we need other measures that are more centered on wealth. So now how we can get those other measures and how they can be applied in a post-COVID recovery planning. So just general, we all know this and it's been, you know, in, even in textbooks now that there are many aspects that GDP is not integrating well and therefore giving a misleading picture about sustainability that relates, for example, to environmental degradation, increasing inequality, loss of uh, power, uh, property or production due extreme events, or raising household debts. And while these things are not captured in GDP when we are thinking about the sustainability of growth and recovery, in the same time, they are very important from the well-being in the society and in the countries. So then how we should think about this or how we should um, address this. So one way of thinking about this would be like a thinking about as a baking analogy. So we can envision GDP as a strawberry pie on the bottom of this slide. And basically our, our aim is to grow the strawberry pie. And more we grow the strawberry pie, the GDP is growing. But in order to be able to produce these strawberry pies and make them grow, we need ingredients. And unless we grow these ingredients that are critical to grow the strawberry pie, we won't be able to soon grow the strawberry pie or big enough strawberry pie. So now then the question is from the policy and planning, what are those ingredients? What is the stock of those ingredients that we need to grow in order to be able to produce our GDP, which in this case is a strawberry pie? So here, uh, we basically can say that there are two indices that you can find in the literature and they are assessed at the country level by international organizations. Sometimes it's called comprehensive wealth, sometimes it's called inclusive wealth, sometimes it's only a, a bunch of indicators, but they usually recognize five critical ingredients. And these five critical ingredients are basically the sources of wealth that help the country to build the GDP and well-being of those citizens in the future. And so these five ingredients are basically fairly intuitive, but they are nicely uh, put into different types of capital and, and distinct types of capital, which help us to structure a post-COVID recovery strategy. So first one is related to produce capital. So we need to account for roads, uh, railways, uh, infrastructure, another type of physical uh, capital. The next one is the human capital, which relates to skill development, capabilities, knowledge of people in order to engage in the labor market, 
uh, earn living and also in, in engage in formal and other informal activities. Of course, the natural capital, and there have been a lot of talk about natural capital, which includes those resources of natural capital that we can learn, uh, earn income, like forests and minerals, and also ecosystem services that makes our life and also uh, the nature possible to function. Then there are also a less tangible resource, which is social capital, which means how the societies operate and how people accept norms, how they adhere to laws, how they foster social inclusion and participate in governance. And we know that better these things are working in societies, um, they are much more able to uh, create a prosperous society. And finally, financial capital that covers stocks and bonds and other financial assets. So now when we look at these five assets, it, we are still don't know much about like what it means in terms of the planning and post-COVID recovery. So before we go into specific uh, recommendations, let's look at the sources of information for you. So the first one are the Wealth of the Nation database, that is the wealth accounting run by the World Bank, and they provide uh, country level estimates that they publish regularly as a large report, but also as a data set for each country across uh, some of the capitals. The similar approach is, for, is the inclusive wealth report that is developed by UNEP, that again provides country data estimates over the last 10 years for, by capitals. And then also you can find data sources that are specific for some types of capitals. They are quite many. So I listed here specifically the word inequality database that looks at the inequality challenges across countries. So now let's look at what it means. So let's go through the capitals and let's discuss briefly what it means, what kind of things we could think about when we include this type of wealth approach to post-COVID recovery. So first one is the produce capital. So the produce capital can be seen through a, as an infrastructure type of activity that is extremely critical to achieve a number of SDGs. We can think of agriculture that we need to invest into roads, we need to invest to market access, communication infrastructure, banking related infrastructure. So there's a lot even in something that is not typically an infrastructure based SDG. Then they are in focus on SDG 6. So water, SDG7 energy, cities, and so on. So produce capital currently accounts for around 20% of total wealth in many countries, but it's highly diverse and in low income countries it's much lower. And let's say in sub-Saharan Africa, it's only around less than 5% based on the UNEP report in the 2014 data. So from a post-COVID re uh, recovery planning, it means that including types of produce capital that especially to address the infrastructure challenges, new technologies, uh, promoting efficient management and processing systems are extremely critical for especially those countries that has a huge infrastructure deficit to increase the share of their produce capital. It's also uh, important to think about the relationship between the capitals. And here it's also important to think about how some of the improvements in produce capital can reduce dependence and so increase efficiency of the use of land and forest and other natural resources. And therefore we are moving away from just building our wealth on natural resource use, instead of building our wealth through produce capital and engagement with human capital. And finally, with building a global economy and advancement in terms of modern technologies, there is absolutely necessary to think about how to invest into R&D, co uh, co competitiveness, and other types of modern um, technology that is basically key to be effective in the future economy. The second source that we can think of is the human capital. So the human capital is what we all have in terms of our skills to get a job, to get living, uh, living income, and to be able to engage in the labor market. In developed countries, um, and usually in other countries, many of other countries, the human capital is the, is the biggest wealth that countries have. On average, it's almost up to 60%. And there is also a rising trend in the role of human capital globally because we need more and more skilled labor to be engaged in sophisticated technologies to deliver products. Even in lower middle income countries, the role of human capital grew around 10% for the last decade. So now what it means from a post-COVID recovery? It definitely means that in terms of uh, planning uh, after COVID, we need to think of specifically of investments into health, but also into education and especially higher education that brings the, the highest return to the country's wealth and future ability to grow. 
Also, there is uh, more awareness, and it's also very important to re-engage youth in, in labor market and provide adequate skills and training so that they can actually engage with their skills. And then also promoting access to education and therefore access to good jobs, uh, to, and therefore promoting SDG 8 to people that are on the bottom of the income level and they could be marginalized from better educational and job opportunities. So now let's look at the next capital, which is natural capital. And I'm handing over to Matthew from the Bennett Institute. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much, Livia, for this brilliant introduction to what a new approach to economic progress and prosperity might look like. We know that the GDP growth story has created loads of benefits and, and a great deal of uh, improvement in the human condition. Living standards have grown, literacy rates have grown, uh, the deaths from uh, uh, famine and hunger have fallen. But we also know that alongside a century's worth of gains in the, in the human condition, we have seen a depletion of natural capital, a destruction of our natural world, which now has created environmental pressures that threaten to wipe out that entire century worth of increased living standards. So what am I talking about when I refer to natural capital? Well, it's those bits of the environment that directly underpin everything we do in the economy. It's things like ecosystems that provide crop pollination services. It's things like mangrove forests that protect us from storm surges. It's things like a stable climate system that prevent runaway sea level rise and protect us from forest fires and deep freezes. And of all of the assets, of all of those ingredients in our economic pantry that we have to combine to generate our economic prosperity, the only asset that has been in sustained global decline is natural capital. It's species loss, it's carbon emissions, it's deforestation and it's overfishing. But Natural capital doesn't have to just be a doom and gloom story. It's central to delivering the sustainable development goals. We've tried to map on the side of the screen a few of the goals that are directly underpinned by natural capital, by nature. Investing in natural capital is actually the investment opportunity of the millennium. And what we can do if we manage it appropriately is we can deliver green jobs based on new technologies. We can decarbonize and get ourselves off the internal combustion engine, improving air quality and therefore the health and productivity of the labor force. And we can deliver the low carbon climate resilient infrastructure that is so desperately needed to deliver clean water and sanitation, to revolutionize our agricultural system and to protect us from zoonotic diseases like COVID-19. How much natural capital is there? Well, even the most conservative estimates suggest that this asset has a, has a capitalized value of around 100 trillion. And we know that's an underestimate. That's too much value not to include in our economic recovery strategy. Livia, could I have the next slide, please? But the degradation of natural capital, it, it arises because of failures of markets and failures of collective action. It's a global resource and we need to work to maintain it and protect it and enhance it together. And one of the assets that we could use in order to do that is called social capital. It's the trust that we have among other people, the trust we have with our institutions and in our governments. It's the ability of communities to come together to overcome collective action problems. Social capital is what convinced us to start wearing masks and to socially distance when we needed to, because that's what was best for our communities. And we have measures of what social capital looks like around the world. We can actually start to measure this stuff and account for it. And so what we're showing you here is by country, the proportion of the population that agrees with the statement that in general, 
most people can be trusted. And the alternatives are, well, I don't know, or maybe you can't be too careful. And what we see is that social capital is a resource around the world, but it's unequally distributed. It determines our pandemic response. Areas with higher social capital had better COVID outcomes. Our research at the Bennett demonstrates that it directly links to productivity. And we know that social capital is a resource that can be relied on in times of political conflict, including in war. So what are the action points that we need in order to invest in and enhance social capital locally and globally? Well, one of the most important things we can do is to empower communities. And that's just as true in the wealthiest countries and in the poorest countries. We need to empower communities, give them agency, and let them make decisions that affect their own futures. We need to invest in social infrastructure, the physical places and spaces where people of all different backgrounds, different races, different ages, different genders, come together and meet and interact because that's the most effective way to break down barriers and build trust. And we desperately need to improve measurement. Of all the components of wealth, social capital has been the one that has been most ignored by the, by the statistical community. And we need to fix that. When we talk about investing in infrastructure, one element of infrastructure that is often overlooked is the statistical infrastructure, the ability to measure things and know facts about the world, which is why it's so exciting that the UN this year has released its first natural capital accounting guidelines to help build that social, that natural capital accounting infrastructure. Livia, could I have the next slide, please? Now, of course, I'm an economist, so I'm going to speak a little bit about finance and financial capital. It's hugely important. But there are some basic facts that we need to know about the world. And as much as we want our governments to act and need our governments to act, and I hope that's what they'll be doing at this week's meeting and in COP26 in Glasgow, there is no chance, zero, absolutely no chance of meeting the Paris Climate Agreement, of limiting warming to two degrees, without the mass mobilization of private financial capital. Government budgets are simply not big enough. What we've seen this year is that gov government budgets are stretched to the max after just 15 trillion of COVID stimulus. That's a drop in the bucket compared to what we need to deliver the infrastructure that meets the sustainable development goals, that meets the Paris Climate Agreement. And so what we need is to mobilize private finance. And there's a huge incentive to do this because we know that the climate value at risk globally of all of the world's financial assets is at least two to 20%. But we also know that we have to act now. My own research has recently shown that if we don't act now to combat climate change, then climate change will reduce the credit worthiness of nations, which means it will increase the cost that countries have to pay to borrow money to borrow money to invest in things like education and infrastructure and healthcare. And what I'm showing you on this map is the distribution of those downgrades, the reduction in credit worthiness that countries will find. And what you see is that nobody escapes this. This isn't a story for rich countries or poor countries. It's not a story for the North or the South or the East or the West, big, small. This is a story for all countries. Nobody escapes this. If I could have the, the next slide, please. So we're coming to the end of our time, uh, and I wanted to leave you with some basic ABCs of inclusive wealth to deliver the SDGs. And when we start thinking about this wealth paradigm, one of the most important things to remember is that it's not just the accumulation of wealth that matters, but it's the access to that wealth that people and communities have. Can people actually use our shared inclusive wealth to deliver prosperity, to enhance their own well-being and that of their families and their communities.
B, the challenge is not to build back to what we had before the pandemic. The challenge is to build forward to something better. And if you want to do that, the way to do it is by investing in our inclusive wealth. So build wealth to build forward. And finally, the last thing I want to leave you with is I hope you'll join me in searching for the synergies between the capitals. This isn't a story of individual ingredients to make up our economic pie. It's a story of a recipe. They have to be combined together. And so when we think about building new homes, we know the value of that produced physical asset will be higher if we also build in the natural capital, the green space that needs to be there in order to improve the air quality. And if we do that to improve the air quality, we know that the human capital will be better because with clean air, students perform better in school and workers perform better in the workforce. And so we must always search for the synergies, the links between the capitals. The sustainable development goals tell us where we want to be by 2030. Inclusive wealth comprises the foundations that will help us get there. I think that's our time. Uh, is, is there maybe one more slide to flag next, uh, the next talk? So we do have uh, another talk in which we'll go into further depth on inclusive wealth and explain a bit more about some of the capitals. And this is coming up uh, on the 11th of July. And so you can see the details here on the slide. It's uh, 13 to 14.30 New York time. And there's a registration link at the bottom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Livia and, and Matthew, for shifting our perspectives in terms of how we consider wealth and, and capital. Uh, it's been really fascinating, a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, talking about food, you made a, a convincing case to grow the strawberry pie and, and you know, sort of make it bigger and consider all those different capitals um, uh, as key, key uh, ways to achieve the SDGs. So thank you very much. Um, I encourage everyone in the audience to um, post you know, your questions in the Q&A box uh, and uh, Livia and Matthew will be very happy to, to address them uh, in the next uh, few minutes until the end of the panel. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, going to the next uh, segment now, uh, the second panel will highlight uh, actionable tools and learnings that aim to accelerate systems level social and environmental transformations that are key for a decade of action. This includes ensuring businesses set ambitious targets and integration of human rights and the SDGs into their business models, integrating stakeholder interests into business practices and strengthening, and strengthening engagement of citizens, social movements and workers in an ecological and social contract. To dive into this issue, um, we have five speakers who will each give you five minutes quick looks on exciting developments in this space. And to start us off, uh, I'd like to introduce Dan Neal, who's the Social Transformation Lead at the World Benchmarking Alliance. And that will, Dan will be discussing a framework for assessing so, so, societal expectations that the world's most influential companies should meet in order to leave no one behind, support the SDGs, and help create a future that works for everyone. Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. I'll just start sharing my screen, and hopefully you can see some slides. Uh, greetings from uh, England, where hopefully football will be coming home later. Uh, it's great to see so many people um, on tonight. I'm from the World Benchmarking Alliance. We rank and rate the most influential companies globally against contributions to systems transformations that are needed for the SDGs. And we use our benchmarks and rankings to help create a movement to try and change corporate behavior. Um, development can't be sustainable if people are left behind, which is why people are at the, the very heart of our model. And we argue that a, uh, a company's impacts on the SDGs really depend on it acting responsibly by respecting human rights, by providing and promoting decent work and acting ethically. 
From those three enablers, we've built a model with 12 high level expectations, which are, you know, such as pay a living wage, you can see them in the circle there, carry out human rights due diligence. These draw on already existing international norms like the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. They represent a very simple set of common behaviors that we expect of all companies if they're going to contribute to sustainable development without leaving people behind. Surrounding this and the focus of the tool discussion are a series of 18 core social indicators that we'll apply on all the companies in our scope, the 2000s most influential companies, regardless of their sector or geography. The enablers, the expectations and the indicators make up the core of our social transformation framework, which launched earlier this year. It's a pretty busy slide, apologies for that, but the 18 indicators that you can see on the right hand side are these, the, the kind of core, if you like, of that, that tool itself. They act as a signpost towards meeting those expectations. Um, if companies want to get out of the house and change the world, these indicators say whether they've gotten to their front door or are still stuck on the couch. If companies don't meet the requirements of the indicators, it really calls into doubt their sustainability commitments and strategies. So if you feel like it, you can think of this as a tool as a way to police any SDG or rainbow washing by companies, or a way of understanding if companies are able to be part of building forward better, as Matthew was talking about. We're applying the indicators at the moment um, across companies in 30 sectors. So whether you're Adidas or BlackRock or Cargill or Daimler, you'll be assessed equally on these topics. The indicators, and I'll flash up an example in a minute, are not what we would call necessarily proxies for good performance. For instance, we know that a commitment to respect human rights in policy doesn't guarantee good human rights performance, but the absence of that policy makes it highly likely that the companies won't be doing what we want of them. So you can think of these indicators a bit like a negative screening in some respects, a benchmark below which we don't want companies to fall. The indicators themselves have different levels of ambition depending on how mature the topic is and what data is made publicly available. But from initial use on companies, they're not easy for companies to achieve by any means, despite being fundamentals. So here's an example of an indicator looking at living wage. Obviously, you want companies to be paying a living wage. Um, and a performance indicator may look at the percentage or the five-year trend of staff paid at least a living wage. But that data just doesn't exist, not within companies or publicly. So we set the indicator to tell us a story, tell us enough about the state of play of living wage and how many companies are making commitments and working towards the payment. The indicators are fully available online. They include the level of detail you can see here, including the elements, the requirements, what it takes to meet them, the scoring, the references, the sources, the whole lot. It's fully available um, for everybody to see, and I'll, I'll flash up the links later and put them in the chat as well. We're using them this year for the first time with the, with the launch of the first thousand in January. We've got experience, though. Some of you may know uh, our corporate human rights benchmark um, that, we've, that we've rolled out for several years in the past. When applied, these indicators, these tools can be used in lots of different ways, whether it's to create rankings or to say how good or bad a company is compared to its peers or to be taken inside a company itself. They can be applied at sectoral, national or regional levels and feed into policy discussions, as well as inform investors for engagement and civil society. The uh, corporate human rights benchmark has examples of data up there previously, which looks at progress over three years on high-risk sectors for human rights. Our experience using these types of indicators show that actually calling out companies, labeling them next to each other and doing the ranking and showing trends over time, you know, we can shift behaviors within companies. And most companies do tend to move if they are there repeatedly uh, assessed and tracked. The non-movers then provide evidence really for the need for policy change. So there's a lot that the data can do and provide. I won't stress it too much to say that other people have been using our tools so far. We've had national level of assessments, uh, for instance, at um, uh, looking at the UNGP implementation to feed into the policy debate. Uh, I, won't, I won't stress this one too much because I realize I'm, I'm running out of time already, just to say that there have been successful applications and we really want to roll this out in similar with our new set of indicators. I'll put my details in the, in the chat box, uh, including the link to the website where you can see the framework and all of the indicators. Apart from that, anyone wishing to use it, please contact us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for your time and I hope you find the tool useful in the rest of the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Uh, now I'll uh, directly hand over to Moanaha Misi Singano, Head of Programs at Femnet. 
Uh, Michi will speak on system change for sustainable and resilient recovery from COVID-19 while building inclusive and effective path for the achievement of SDGs. Uh, Michi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, allow me to start uh, my intervention today uh, by first recognizing that uh, as we gather here uh, in this high level political forum, the COVID pandemic still continues. In Africa, the land that I call home, the third wave is picking up speed, spreading faster and eating even harder. The third wave uh, in Africa in specific um, came when Africa is experiencing vaccine shortage. WHO is saying that slightly more than 1% of Africans have been fully vaccinated. Uh, while approximately 2.7 billion COVID shots have been administered globally, it's only 1.5% of those shots have been administered in the continent. So uh, as we use this space to share learning and foster evidence based uh, to influence decision-making for sustainable and just COVID recovery and transformative SDG implementation, we should start by mourning the loss of families, friends, elders, colleagues, and feminist comrades. We also uh, mourn those who have lost their lives to COVID or those who have lost their lives uh, because of under-resourced and overwhelmed healthy system. And not to forget, uh, to forget those who have lost their lives because of violence in our homes. And, and, and importantly, I think we should equally uh, mourn and start mourning the loss of life that is to come uh, as Global North continue uh, to hold vaccine and prioritize intellectual property rights and profit over lives, especially of the people of the Global South. So back to, uh, to evidence and, 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 and facts, uh, UN Women did estimate uh, that additional 77 million women and girls will fall into extreme poverty. I think these uh, facts are known, but we also know prior the pandemic, uh, almost 92% of women workers were employed in informal sector. Yet, as of March uh, 2021, only 11% of social protection um, and labor market measure responding to COVID addressed and paid care and really focus and, 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 and support uh, those who worked on informal sectors. Indeed, uh, COVID has made what feminists have long emphasized that the profit made uh, in economies and market have always been subsidized by women and paid uh, care work and domestic work. And even what now we call essential service which has been at the center in the response to this COVID pandemic has even now felt to be acknowledged and addressed in, in several policies. So during the, during the pandemic, uh, most of the feminists across the world tracked, monitored and make sense of the pandemic, but also make sense of the, uh, of the facts figure, data, but also what is not reported and what is not said. As for example, Feminit, we did develop a Pan-Africa COVID response hub, which we tracked COVID response from the government, private sector, uh, from community across the continent. The feminist collective developed a feminist monitoring and tracking toolkit, which allows us to observe, reflect, and provide specific guidance and the recommendation when it comes to, uh, to policy. With all that work that has been done during the pandemic, the evidence have never been clear and the fact have never been compelling. And what all this evidence and facts we are telling is one story that we need a system change. Government system have been inadequate in responding to the pandemic, especially this because this system have been built on a patriarchy, white supremacy, colonialism, militarism, neoliberalism, and authoritarianism. Hence, 
we are now facing this intersecting crisis, which is yet uh, to, to move even an inch. Without system change, this is structural inequality will continue to shape our pandemic response, but also will it derail us further from achieving the gender equality and the sustainable development uh, goals as we all uh, uh, wish to have achieved. State should really uh, heed the call from the feminist and advocate advocates to place economic, racial, climate, and gender justice at the center of COVID recovery, but also at the center of S SDG implementation. Um, as, as, as feminists, but also as women major group, we do strongly believe in multilateralism system, but it should be a system that is grounded on human rights, not system that races to the lowest common denominator, but the one that foster global solidarity and collaboration. We need a world uh, to adopt a feminist COVID recovery policies and packages that include fiscal policy, expenditure policy, and labor market policy that addressing informal economy and, 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 and both uh, and care economy as well. And importantly, I think we, we think uh, the government should use human rights based approach to implement SDG agenda and to respond to COVID pandemic and it's all related to crisis. This means they should respect, protect, and fulfill human rights, uh, human rights and fundamental freedom of women and, and girls in all their diversity. Lastly, uh, we need uh, all of us collectively, government, UN agencies, uh, private sector, feminists, all of us, we need to dismantle the unjust economic system that perpetuates and deepen inequality between and within countries and to build a peaceful, just and inclusive society. This should be challenging. This should include challenging and end privatization and commodification of public goods and services, exploitation of biodiversity and natural resources, and endless sake of unsustainable debt, trade agreement, which undermines uh, labor rights. I must say, as I finish, M Mishi, outsourcing- yes, If you could wrap up, thanks a lot. Yes, I, I must say, uh, outsourcing this work to what we call philanthropic capitalist is a failed strategy for the continent like Africa, but importantly, is a failed strategy for the implementation of SDG. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that very important perspective and for highlighting the, the systemic dimensions as well of uh, around the COVID crisis. I think that that's very important. So thank you. Um, I'll keep the rhythm and, and move on to the next speaker, uh, who is Isabel Kempf, head of the Bonn Office and senior research coordinator at the UN Research Institute for Social Development. And Isabel will uh, uh, talk to us about uh, the need of a new eco-social contract for SDG implementation and recovery from COVID. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Yes, thank you. I'm so pleased to see so many of you here uh, tonight um, and uh, greetings from Unrest in Bonn. Um, and I think it's really important that we kind of collectively discuss and, and um, have a reflection on what is the kind of transformation that we need for SDG implementation and what is uh, hindering us to realize that transformation. Um, and what I um, would like to share is a little bit the outcome of um, the UNRIST research that UNRIST has been doing over the years on the question of inequality, but also on climate justice. And it surely um, shows that the 20th century social pro, uh, contract has pro been uh, breaking down. And it's not enough to, to sustain the transformative vision of the, of the SDG. Um, and that really, you can see that in multiple crises, the COVID crisis is the most recent one, but it's reoccurring crisis as well. Um, and also the inequality that's rising uh, in most of our societies. And I think the famous Oxfam study on the 1% uh, of the population holding, you know, 90% of the wealth is one of the, the really kind of important evidences that shows that we don't only have to look 
at those that are left behind, but we also have to look at the top of the pyramid of those who hold most of the wealth and the concentration of wealth. And there's a lot of evidence for that as well. And then of course, then also our relationship with nature that is broken and that our economic model is not uh, allowing us to live within the planetary boundaries. And again, there is a lot of evidence on that. And, um, and, and really the kind of precarity that we're now seeing because of climate change and also uh, you know, the health pandemic such as COVID-19. Um, and I would like to encourage you to read uh, for more of the, the, the current analysis on that, uh, the, the UNRIS brief on that, and my colleague Paramita will share it in the chat, uh, where we kind of show, you know, wh wh what is this broken eco-social contract at the moment and why do we need a new one? And, uh, and as you have all been seeing, you know, the, the World Economic Forum, the business sector is asking for a new social contract, the, the Secretary General of the UN is asking for one, uh, the trade unions are demanding, you know, we need a new social contract and the social and ecological movements are demanding a new eco-social contract, but do they all mean the same thing? No, unfortunately not. They all have their own agendas and you see the different agendas, what they're asking for in the, in the white boxes and in the blue middle circle, there are the kind of you know, core elements where most of them would agree that they're necessary. And they include things like you know, the, the urgency of the climate and environmental action, gender and racial equality to address historical injustices, uh, the uh, need for network multilateral action that goes beyond member states of the UN, but really includes also the private sector and social movements. Um, the, the question of the trust, uh, just transitions that is often demanded by trade unions. Uh, and then also the business to really ask, you know, we need new skills and we need safety nets for workers. Um, so I think these are the kind of the demands that we are looking at when we talk about a new eco-social contract. But how would this new eco-social contract be different? Of course, it would depend very much on the context, on each country, on each community. But it, I think it has a few core elements uh, that we all discussed and my, the previous speakers also alluded to. One is that a new eco-social contract would be based on human rights for all. You know, I think it's not acceptable that, you know, uh, informal workers, migrant workers, uh, indigenous peoples are left out of the current social contract. So there needs to be a new contract that includes and makes sure that no one is left behind. A progressive fiscal contract, you know, this needs to be financed. And I think the first speaker eloquently showed, you know, what kind of access to wealth, access to income, uh, we need to be able to make sure, you know, that this wealth is being distributed uh, in a fair manner. The transformation of our economies and societies, behavioral change, you know, what kind of laws and regulations can help us that people actually have a more sustainable uh, behavior. Uh, the contract with nature, you know, what kind of economic models and, and, and systems can we uh, have? Uh, what are the best practices where we can live in harmony with nature? How can we address historical injustice? The, fame, the previous speaker talked about, you know, um, what happens, you know, in a society where people are discriminated against because of their, of their sex or of their, of their race, et cetera. Uh, and the contract for gender justice, yeah, so that's uh, really, really important. You know, how can uh, different parts of society live together, share the burden, the care burden? Um, and I think this is really important, new forms of solidarity. In the liberal democracies, often it's this interest, you know, so it's we against them. But I think the new solidarity needs this idea of we all together against COVID, against climate change. Um, and I think these new forms of solidarity um, and, and you know, the best practices of how this can be formed are really important. And this is the kind of evidence we would like to bring to the discussion. And in order to do that, um, Andres yeah, is building- Sorry, Isabel, network. if you could soon wrap up. Yeah. We Thanks. are building a new network together with the Green Economy Coalition and you are really welcome to be part of it where we'll foster dialogue and action uh, towards a new eco-social contract. So thanks a lot for your interest and please feel welcome to contact us. Thanks.
thanks a lot, Isabel. Um, and thanks for, I think, you know, getting us forward in these sessions, the sort of red thread of rethinking uh, the sort of socio, so, socioeconomic dynamics that we've taken for granted uh, until now and to really have a new approach to that. So thank you very much. Uh, I think that really builds upon the, the prevent, uh, previous presentations as well. Um, so I'll continue and hand over to Andrea Padilla, head of regional hub Hispanic America at the Global Reporting Initiative. And Andrea will give an update on the Columbia SDG Corporate Tracker, which is a multi-stakeholder platform launched to measure Colombia's progress towards achieving the, the SDGs by 2030. And uh, she will also present uh, preliminary findings from a study titled Shining a Light on Human Rights, Progress on Corporate Human Rights Performance Disclosure. Uh, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. What a privilege to be here today. I hope everyone is doing well and thriving, regardless of the circumstances. The story that I am about to tell you is a story of partnerships. It's a story of unusual organizations getting together to try to take us from a what conversation to a how conversation, how we could actually bring private sector to care, implement, measure, and report on their contributions to sustainable development. The first tool that I'll be discussing today is the SDG Corporate Tracker, which is an initiative that we launched four and a half years ago. And I call it four years in the making, four years in the learning, because it feels like we just got started. And it's a private a public partnership between the government of Colombia, UNDP Business Call to Action, and the Global Reporting Initiative to try to standardize data collection by capturing the contribution of the private sector to sustainable development through the SDGs. It helps analyze data by sector, size, and region within Colombia to better map business progress and challenges toward the SDGs. It helps identify best practices that companies can actually incorporate in their operations to take the SDGs from a conceptual level to an operational level. And it helps us gather information that will actually contribute to the development of public policy decision-making. In practice, this is a platform, an online platform for companies uh, to assess how they're contributing towards each of the SDGs. And in Colombia, it's so far used by over 480 companies, most of them small and medium enterprises, which were a missing link in the private sector discussion. A similar tool to track business progress towards SDGs has been developed in Peru. and We've also supported the efforts of Honduras in this direction. The tracker then uses an online questionnaire that connects with the GRI standards, which for those that are not aware are the most widely used sustainability reporting standards. And it kind of works like uh, those um, bilingual dictionaries, Spanish, English, French, English, English, French. It was kind of public sector, private sector, and how we can actually uh, bridge, create a bridge between the two around the SDGs. And it collects relevant business data on the three pillars of sustainability, uh, crossing that with each of the targets of the SDG. I thought I would bring an example of how data is being aggregated, but of course there is a lot that you can analyze with the data that we're collecting at the moment. Uh, but we, we kind of, some of the preliminary results as well are 41% uh, of the companies that are reporting and are using these um, are doing some sort of voluntary social investment. And out of all the companies that are using the platform, 36% are also doing a sustainability report. And this is important because target 12.6 speaks specifically about issuing sustainability reports as one of the major targets in this agenda. And 44% of companies report on having at least a policy on respect to business and human rights, which is quite crucial for the discussions we've been having. So you can also take a look in there at how they're um, reporting data on SDG 8 and SDG 13. Companies do get to pick what those what SDGs are most material to their operations, how they're contributing to the achievement of those SDGs and public sector in turn uses the data. 
Navigating the learning curve of turning this short language into an actionable plan um, has been very challenging, but also very rewarding. And we've learned that multi-stakeholder takes longer, but pays off. It's, it, this is crucial to the implementation of, of actually measuring private sector contribution with support from public sector. Having implementing partners such as associations and chambers of commerce is really important to really get these working at the operational level. Uh, the data collected is then used by the national government in the VNR, and you'll see it in this VNR um, year. And it's an opportunity for businesses to begin the journey of reporting using the GRI standards and also contribute to 12.6. The second tool I'd like to mention is, is a study that also a partnership that we're conducting with the Danish Institute for Human Rights and Centro Vincular where we are using actually an algorithm to take a look at the information being reported on business and human rights. And we are coupling that with interviews that we're doing with companies in order to understand what are the trends, opportunities, and the current status of uh, human rights reporting in the mining metals, energy, and financial service sector. The full report will be launched at the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights this uh, coming November. But some of the preliminary results is that there is still, as you can imagine, very low transparency in terms of, of the human rights policy. While we do see a positive trend in terms of an increase, it almost doubled from the last study we did to this one. We also expect an increase in the transparency indicators related to human rights due diligence also have been supported or fostered by all the due diligence legislations from around the world. And we also see a positive trend in the number of reports including information on human rights topics between 2011 and 2016. Uh, but this, there is still a room for improvement in terms of consistency, quality, and of course, quantity of data. Uh, with that, I'd like just to close uh, saying that partnerships are not the best way. They're the only way to achieve SDGs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, thanks for sharing your experience at the national level. And I'm sure that uh, that can inspire others as well. So thank you very much. Um, last but not least for this segment of the session, I'd like to introduce Elena Bodvina, uh, Economic Affairs Officer in the Division of Investment and Enterprise at UNCTAD. UNCTAD has identified the need for baseline SDG indicators for companies to enable the harmonization, comparability, and benchmarking of enterprise reporting. To that end, they developed the guidance on core indicators for entity reporting on contribution towards the implementation of the SDGs. And Elena will present uh, these key concepts, the main principles, and framework of this guidance. Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicholas, and greetings to all panelists and participants of today. So uh, on behalf of UNCDAT, I would like to share results of our work on the core indicators and entity reporting and measuring the private sector contribution towards implementation of sustainable development goals. Sorry. Yeah. So UNCTAD is a secretariat of the Intergovernmental Working Group of Experts on International Standards of Accounting and Reporting and also a focal point on enterprise accounting and reporting issues in the UN. Within the context of 2030 agenda, ISA contributes to enhancing the role of enterprise reporting in assessing the private sector contribution to the SDGs. And in 2016, as Nicholas mentioned, UNCTAD launched its initiative on selecting a limited number of core SDG indicators to facilitate companies reporting on SDGs, as well as to improve comparability of sustainability reporting in alignment with SDG macro indicators. The objective of the GCI guidance is, first of all, to provide practical information on how these indicators could be measured in a consistent manner. Secondly, to assist governments to assess the private sector contribution to the SDG implementation and measure their uh, performance towards SDG indicator 12.6%. Point one. And last but not least, to assist entities to provide baseline data on sustainability issues. The core SDG indicators have been identified based on key reporting principles, selection criteria, main reporting frameworks, and companies' existing reporting practices. They represented in four main areas, economic, environmental, social, and institutional. And that's approach is based on the logical framework connecting sustainable development goals via targets and indicators 
macro indicators with micro level enterprise indicators. And you can see examples of some of the indicators on the screen with a breakdown by dimension. All of them already exist in the reporting practices of many companies, including the SMEs. Uh, we conducted uh, a practical implementation to examine the relevance and applicability of the GCI and validate the suggested approach by conducting 20, more than 20 case studies in different geographical areas in a great range of industries with companies of different sizes, including the SMEs. The key finding is that most of the core indicators could be reported. You can see uh, a diversity of uh, in, uh, industries that were engaged in the case study research, as well as the countries who participated in the project. Uh, uh, please familiarize yourself with all materials uh, related to the GCI concept on our ISA website, and I will be happy to share it in the chat box, including the guidance itself, case study volume published, training manual, which is a technical guidance to improve data availability, and we're currently working on e-learning materials on that topic. And that is also a co-custodian who works in cooperation with UN Environment on the methodological development for the SDG indicator 12.6.1. We have developed the metadata guidance and also established the data collection mechanism. The results of the pilot testing of data collection mechanism has been already prepared and it was uh, collected in 2020. You can see some of the results on the screen that shows the percentage of companies reporting uh, on the four dimensions uh, with a breakdown by regions. And you can see that companies from such regions as Northern America and Europe, Latin America as well as Southeastern Asia, they demonstrate a high level of reporting while there are still significant gaps in other regions. I would also like to uh, invite you to our upcoming ISER session, the 38th session in November, that will cover main agenda items on review of practical implementation of the GCI indicators, as well as climate-related financial disclosures. And taking this opportunity, I would like to announce a call for ISER owners. This is an initiative that was launched in 2018 with an objective to raise awareness and facilitate dissemination of national and international best practices on sustainability and SDG reporting. Uh, please submit your application with such nominations uh, as you can see them on the screen, some examples, good reporting practices, guidelines for reporting frameworks, implementing indexes, benchmark mechanism, for knowledge hub platforms. The Eyes Around the Ceremony will take place at the World Investment Forum that will be held in Abu Dhabi in October this year. You still have some time to apply. The application deadline is very short by 10th of July. And I would like to show a very quick video to demonstrate the key objectives of the initiative. So I'll, I'll switch to the video. passing back to you. Thanks a lot, Elena, for presenting this guidance. Um, it seems like a very practical tool that people can use. And thanks for the, the opportunities and incentives that you, you've presented. Um, so this wraps the second segment uh, of today's session, which I think a lot of, offered a lot of food for thought in terms of rethinking uh, approaches that we have um, in terms of socioeconomic development, social contracts. Uh, and, and measurement as well. So thanks uh, a lot to the, the previous panelists. And now heading to the uh, third segment, uh, we are getting uh, a bit above the clouds to discuss insights on how uh, satellite technology and data can strengthen, strengthen evidence-based decision-making for sustainable, climate-resilient and inclusive development uh, with a special focus on uh, actual cases of small island states in the Pacific. And to start, start us off, uh, I'd like to introduce Einar Bjorgo, 
Director of Satellite Analysis and Applied Research uh, at uh, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and Manager of uh, the UN Satellite Center, UNOSAT. And I now will address the benefits and challenges of using geospatial information technology and satellite Earth observation data to strengthen evidence-based decision-making. He will illustrate how this has been applied to the common sensing solution being implemented in the Pacific small island states. This includes emergency responses to tropical cyclones, preparedness measures for COVID-19, and planned relocations in the context of climate change. I know the floor is yours. Thank you Thanks. so much. Really, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I just want to uh, first give you a little bit of, of insights uh, of what this technology can do. Uh, we talk about satellite imagery, we talk about what we call geographic information systems. Some of you may be aware of it, but uh, I'd like to just do a little bit of, of a quick introduction because this technology is really something that can be used uh, all over the world. And especially we see this uh, in this point in time in the COVID pan pandemic, uh, where getting information from distance from far places far away can be difficult to get, but uh, this remote assessment can then be very important. So basically you can get access to current information from all over the world. Uh, you can also get access to historic information, which is what is really important. We can have um, uh, data going back to all the way to the early 1970s in, in many places. Also, when you combine this with access to future climate information based on modeling, uh, you can then overlay this information with uh, ground data and you can get very detailed information about what the situation is uh, at specific uh, places around the world. So how can you then combine this and being able to understand the existing and future risks of, of your community and your, your um, uh, let's say regions in a country? So this is what we're trying to, to solve. However, there are some challenges. Uh, there's a lack of national capacity in many countries uh, for using this type of technologies uh, and lack of capacity to access and analyze and visualize this type of data. There's also in many countries scattered information with no central point for data sharing and facilitation. And also in many cases, the costs can be an issue. Now, um, how did we try to solve this? Uh, we are basically very fortunate because we are um, teaming up with a, a consortium called IPP Common Sensing. Um, this is financed by the UK Space Agency. Uh, and it's about enhancing climate resilience and strategic development for Pacific SIDS using satellite solutions. And my colleague Liz Cox will um, uh, uh, explain more about this program uh, afterwards. But just um, to give you a little bit of, of uh, background. Um, so basically we are looking at uh, two, two ways of doing this type of support. One being technical platforms and data cubes. Data cubes are basically um, a, um, a history of satellite imagery collected over time. And so you have all the information available and then specific products used at that. So you can, for example, look at land cover changes over time. You can look at how um, uh, inland water has changed, etc. Uh, but then uh, to, to really support the countries, we're looking at also at capacity development activities. And, and um, based on this, we are able to focus on we together with the, with the, after consultations with the countries, we decided to focus on four specific thematics. One being uh, climate change adaptation, uh, uh, and including food security, including disaster resilience, and also quite importantly, uh, access to climate funding. So, um, in terms of um, the technical platform that we have developed, um, some of these are really, uh, I would say, focusing on specific issues. So we spent quite a bit of time uh, looking uh, together with the, um, the three uh, countries, which is Fiji, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands, how can we best support them? We, we spent a lot of time together with the government employees uh, and, and stakeholders, uh, uh, also academia in these countries to really find out what can we do to help. So we were able to, to develop various um, decision support systems this example is on the disaster risk reduction platform, uh, access to current information, access to historic information, building and understanding of future climate risk resubmission, and, and really to, to serve both technical experts, sectoral experts, decision makers, and also secondary regional users. 
So we had really good feedback on this. Uh, the, this platform has been used now uh, in both at the test phase and it's being rolled out. And really, uh, we, the feedback we're getting is that it really has a, a high potential to be extremely useful for, for various applications, including access to climate finance proposals. Now, in terms of capacity development, we are also um, very fortunate because we have um, uh, colleagues sitting with the, uh, the different line ministries that, uh, or the main focal point ministries, as you say, in the three countries. Uh, so by doing that, we are able to both um, uh, have, a, 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 let's say, a dedicated uh, training, uh, depending on the specific needs of the various countries, and also looking at um, how we can best support them in terms of transferring this knowledge into direct applications. And we were quite, quite impressed, I have to say, when we saw how the National Disaster Management Office in Fiji was able to use the skills they, they, they had acquired during tropical cyclone Yasa to, um, to really uh, inform um, the, the, the various stakeholders on the situation, being able to use this, the, the various uh, tools that we have been using, using the, for example, the damage assessment from the satellite imagery, and really to, to have a live dashboard showing the results of these assessments. So, so this is something that, um, you know, it's in, very um, interesting to see how uh, training and capacity development can be used um, very, very efficiently. And if you allow me, I will also just um, uh, inform a, a little bit on how it's also being used uh, at, um, at various levels with the government. Uh, Mr. Shivanal Kumar is the uh, climate change adaptation specialist in the Ministry of Economy in Fiji. And um, uh, I would just like to highlight some of his points and please uh, bear, with me, bear with me with that, whether I sort of read out this slide because these are his words. Common, the Common Sensing Project has strengthened the capacity for the use of DIT and satellite imagery and bridge existing data gaps in Fiji. Now we are in a much improved place where strategic decisions can be made quickly using the data and information. And this is really important. With respect to climate finance, there's ongoing support that helps design an evidence-based climate change proposal to enhance access to climate finance. And small island uh, states have uh, uh, traditionally been really, really lacking in terms of being successful in, in enhancing uh, access to climate finance. So, so this, um, those were very important. When it comes to climate resilience, during the cyclone season in the last few years, the project provided assistance to the Fijian government and NDMO uh, with their analysis and satellite images and elevation model has helped the team on the ground carry out damage and needs assessment effect effectively as well as in planning and development strategies for disaster risk preparedness and reduction. So being able to bridge not just um, the immediate response, being, being seeing how can you transfer those, uh, um, that knowledge and that information to be more uh, better prepared. Uh, also importantly, in terms of climate um, displacement, which I'll come back to with a case study, is a huge reality in this region and very much in Fiji. Using the common sensing tools and data, we have started to prioritize the top 15 communities in urgent need of relocation. Without the common sensing platform, this um, would have been very, very difficult to achieve. Now, also, I would like you to hear from my colleague, Lamba, uh, who is uh, based with the Ministry of Economy in Fiji and how her daily uh, work is basically going on. In terms of supporting communities that are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, through the Common Sensing Project, uh, we have information through the DRR Decision Support Platform and Open Data Cube that indicate areas that are at risk. Uh, for example, areas within coastal zones that are vulnerable to receding coastlines and thus they're exposed to coastal inundation and sea level rise. The issue of climate-induced uh, community relocation in Fiji is, uh, is a consultative, sensitive and, and costly process that require engagement and collaboration at all levels of decision making. Uh, how we can contribute to that process in a way is with uh, the risk assessment um, methodology that um, that we that we are deploying, where we can demonstrate uh, by these common sensing tools how users can compare uh, the level of risks at the subnational uh, district level. Uh, this is useful in terms of guiding future planning of safer zones to relocate. Uh, to relocate these communities to. 
And uh, when you look at the risks for a particular vulnerable community, what are the factors that are mostly contributing to their to their vulnerability or to their particular challenges? Challenges, and in showing that, uh, you highlight for planners government and development partners areas that they can invest or direct resources to uh, to reduce these vulnerabilities and thus we take a course of action towards uh, remedial measures that can improve uh, the situations for these communities. So just to give you um, a, a practical example of this uh, I would like to show you this video. This is basically a, a GIS system in the back but very much a consultative process. So there's uh, several communities, uh, uh, as was mentioned, uh, around Fiji that needs to uh, potentially relocate. You can see how they are uh, quite vulnerable at the coastline. And we can have different, um, for example, coastal flood exposure, tropical cyclone winds. And then how should we go about to reduce the risk. So we have basically um, developed together with uh, the ministry in charge of this various um, options for the communities to relocate. Now, what is really important here is that this is done in a very consultative process. It's extremely important that uh, the government uh, is speaking directly with, of course, the affected communities and that the affected communities has a say. So that was done in this case. And you can see the various, um, I would say, criteria for the site selection that the, the communities themselves came forward with. Now, when you then develop the model, it is again, they themselves, based on the available data, that they decide what are the most important factors for them. Following that, they can also weight the different options. And then you can get the results of where, which places are, uh, let's say, most appropriate for them to move to. You can then compare the sites And there you can see what, which sites, according to their own criteria, would be the best ones to consider. And finally, I would also just like to, to uh, show you this example. This is from um, the Solomon Islands. This is uh, a dashboard that we developed together with uh, the Ministry uh, of, um, of Health. And um, we basically uh, were able to quite fast, I would say, uh, help them with setting up a dashboard on COVID cases because they really had to provide uh, this information uh, very quickly. And being able to have uh, this an, a centralized dashboard, uh, they can have the latest up-to-date information on the various case studies in various places and the various quarantine centers, etc., and they're all able to thus allow for both um, uh, making sure that this data is being used for local police and health health workers, as well as um, other other uh, government employees. So when we saw uh, how, how useful this was, uh, we were quite happy, and we uh, believe that um, you know this technology was set up relatively fast and really made made a difference. Um, just finally, also uh, in terms of uh, making you know this type of um, information available, uh, 
as I said, we can look at various types of, of natural hazards, tropical cyclones, floods, landslides, COVID-19 preparedness, sea level rise, human mobility, and of course also um, other things like, such as protection of a world heritage sites in terms of oil spill, illegal logging, etc. Um, as I mentioned also, access to climate funds, we have, um, again, we teamed up with the, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and there are many funds and, um, and um, communities um, uh, that we are able to engage with, uh, so that we, we really look forward to seeing um, this um, climate finance, uh, uh, let's say, being much more successful by using these systems that we have put in place. So with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Liz. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Einar. Um, very impressive work in supporting decision makers with the relevant data and, and really compelling platforms. Uh, so thanks for, for that showcase. And so um, uh, handing over to Liz Cox, Head of International Engagement, uh, International Partnerships Program at the UK Space Ag Agency. And Liz will provide a brief background of the UK Space Agency's International Partnerships uh, Program that aims to deliver satellite solutions for global sustainable development and new market opportunities. Uh, Liz, the floor is yours. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, and, and also to Aina uh, for your really good overview of uh, how the common sensing project is um, uh, using satellite technology and data uh, to strengthen evidence-based decision making. Um, and also just generally thanks to the UN for being here and, uh, and so great to see so many people from around the world uh, joining this session and even uh, in the early hours of the morning, which is quite incredible. Um, so, uh, yeah, as Aina said, um, uh, common sensing is uh, a um, uh, part of our international partnership program run by the UK Space Agency, which is our Space for Sustainable Development initiative. Um, and so I'm just going to provide some brief background um, on, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get to my slides here. Um, I'm going to provide some brief background on um, the International Partnership Programme and with a small selection of examples of how our funding has supported climate and disaster resilience and also a few observations um, that we've picked up along the way. Um, so are you seeing my slides here and are they moving along? Yes, we can see them. You, you could put them uh, full screen if you want. Uh, the slideshow, uh, I'm but trying, you can see them. trying to. Has that... Uh, does that work now? It Great. doesn't seem, uh, I but we can see them anyway. I think it's there now. Uh, might take a minute. Okay, so um, um, as I said, IPP is our um, Space for Sustainable Development Initiative, and it is um, run by um, the, um, uh, funded by the UK government's Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and their Global Challenges Research Fund, um, which uh, called uh, GCRF, which actually forms part of the UK's official development assistance commitment um, and aligns with UK aid strategy and UN sustainable development goals. So as you can see on the right here, um, uh, IPP um, was launched, well, it was launched in 2016. And since then, we've grant funded 43 projects in 47 developing countries across Africa, Asia Pacific, and Latin America and Caribbean. And these are tackling global development challenges such as climate and disaster resilience, food security, land use management, maritime issues, health, education, urban planning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is very much the primary objective of IPP. Um, and there is a secondary objective, which is um, through these partnerships, partnership being the really crucial um, uh, uh, element here, there are, there are, it facilitates new market opportunities as well. But that is very much secondary. It's about tackling global development challenges. And so, um, as you can see on the, um, the left hand side here, um, when I talk about IPP, it's always about partnership impact and sustainability. So building trusted partnerships, which are forged from the very beginning and grow stronger throughout um, the lifetime of projects. And crucially, end users are always involved from the get-go to ensure the solutions developed meet specific needs. And then there's also training and capacity building, which is that crucial path to um, the positive and practical impacts being delivered to people on the ground, making that real difference to the lives of people on the ground. Um, and that's even after grant funding stops and sustainability so that every project um, is, uh, is, is ideally every project is considered a success 
if that particular solution is used and taken up by the end user in the long term. And so really to reflect the title of, of um, and this slot, um, uh, um, IPP was designed to demonstrate the value of space-based solutions to tackle global development challenges and justify investment in space, that case for space, as I say here, um, to um, uh, make, um, uh, to enable more effective policy uh, decision-making. So, if I move on to my next slide, and um, this is just um, uh, an example of a few um, uh, outcomes and impacts from some of our projects. And as you can see, I've included common sensing, um, which Einar, Einar has just discussed. Um, and he did mention in, as well in terms of uh, some of the, the work that they did to support um, the Pacific SIDS after uh, cyclones. And then there are a couple of others here um, where you can see when in Malaysia, one of the projects, the um, Earth and Sea Observation System, ESOS, um, which was able to um, identify and map three oil spills, which, which had significant cost savings for um, the government of Malaysia. And then also another um, large project in our portfolio called uh, Forest 2020, um, which is actually working in seven countries around the world. Um, but, uh, you know, they have been able to um, uh, uh, monitor um, uh, 1 million hectares of forest uh, using Earth observation. And so this is really about demonstrating um, the monitoring and evaluation that goes on um, it throughout, um, well, all of our projects, but also the, the programme as a whole to continually check and improve um, current and future management of outputs outcomes and impacts to ensure that delivery of measure, measurable and sustainable benefits to people on the ground. Um, and as I say, this is just a very small selection um, because you know, we, we funded um, 43 projects. And um, you can see on the bottom of this slide um, that these are um, just some examples taken from a midline evaluation of our program um, that was carried out in 2019. So that's obviously fairly, um, old now, I, I guess you could say, and actually there is going to be an end line evaluation of our program um, at the end of this year. So um, as you can imagine, there will be lots and lots uh, more outcomes and impacts that we're going to be able to report on. Um, and so um, uh, this is a slide which um, is just um, a, a very um, small selection. Oh. Oh. Um, uh, um, uh, organizations that are involved in, in IPP. Um, and so, as you, as I've said, I mean, the, the name of the program is International Partnership Program. Partnerships are key. And so along with those project outcomes and impacts that um, I, I talked about just now, um, there are also, it's the partnerships that are so important. And actually, um, I noticed earlier as um, Andrea Padilla uh, said from GRI, Partnerships are not the best way, they are the only way. I, I couldn't agree more, Andrea. Um, so, so this is just a small selection of, of the partnerships. Through the programme since 2016, we have facilitated um, uh, new partnerships between over 350 UK and international organisations. And so um, this can be anything, um, well, this includes, uh, for example, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources in the Philippines through to Farmerline in Ghana, um, and the Commonwealth Secretariat through to Feria Ross in, in Colombia. And that's what we're so proud to be doing through IPP. Um, it's facilitating these new partnerships, developing space-based products and services to make the case for space um, to decision makers in countries at the forefront of climate change, and then to really nurture and sustain those relationships in the long term. So- um, Please, if you could kindly wrap up in a minute. Sorry to okay. be rude. Thank okay, you. no problem, no problem, no problem. Um, so really quickly then, um, just a few learnings, um, and I won't go into this then in any, in any detail, um, but the, I, I guess you could say that the key thing that has come out of um, IPP so far is that um, it's proven that space-based solutions have a really strong role to play in, in development challenges. Um, and for example, in um, forestry or, or deforestation, They've proven to be eight times more cost effective in agriculture, six times, and in disaster resilience, twice. And now these are figures, as I mentioned, just from our midline evaluation 
we are very much expecting this to increase um, as we go forward. Um, again, partnerships, it's all about uh, making sure that the end users are involved from the very, very, very get go of projects. Partnerships take time. Capacity development is absolutely crucial. Um, so I was going to go into more detail on this slide and I won't now, um, but um, just very finally, if I may bring your attention to um, a brochure that we have um, recently updated called Space Solutions for Development, which uh, lists uh, um, all of the solutions that we have um, funded, supported through IPP, including common sensing. Um, and, and also, if you have any questions at all, feel free to uh, make contact via the email address there, ipp at ukspaceagency.gov.uk. Um, and uh, just finally, um, as uh, Dan Neal said earlier, um, there is a, 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 another rather, rather important event going on right now. So may football be coming home. Um, and it's just so great, actually, to be involved in an international event right now, just like the match going on. So thank you. Thank you very much, Liz and, and Twainar again uh, for reminding us about the, the really the critical use of satellite data to deal with uh, so many of the global challenges that we're facing. Thanks a lot for that. Um, and so without uh, further ado, uh, let me head into the very final segment uh, of today, which will be on behavioral solutions for evidence-based uh, decision-making. Um, our last speaker is uh, my colleague, Maxim uh, Stoffer. He's a science policy officer at the Geneva Science Policy Interface. Uh, he's also the CEO of the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance. Uh, at the GISPI, his work is uh, focused on uh, brokering scientific knowledge into policy and equipping policymakers and policy actors with tools and knowledge to make decisions in the face of complexity. Uh, so now Max will uh, take the floor and give a presentation on behavioral solutions for evidence-based decision-making. Uh, Maxim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. The support to improve the governance of extreme risks. And, and my presentation is essentially behavioral solutions for evidence based uh, decision making. As we've seen with the other panels, on, on evidence, on information. And uh, I will basically talk about the behavioral angle of all of this. So let's the information aside and let's try to think about what we actually make of information, um, how do we process it, and how do we make uh, decisions. So most decisions on decision making should be run around the pressure areas, um, and production of data and, and policy groups, which uh, inevitably leads to this pile of paper on the right that we all know, um, that we all have on our desk or on our desktop, uh, on our computers. But uh, there's a flip side of this coin is that we need to process this information. And the way we process this information is dependent on, on how we think, is depending on, on our education, on our values, on our emotions and so on. And this is fundamentally a, a behavioral uh, question. What is interesting is that when we talk about behavior in policy, we actually neglect the behavior of uh, decision makers, of the behavior of the policy officials that make decisions at the UN or within national governments. For example, the guidance on behavioral science published by the Secretary General of the UN actually mostly focuses on the target populations of policy institutions, but not on the behavior of the decision makers. Then in the center on behavioral public policy, has only one chapter out of 30 that actually addresses decision-making of policymakers, of policy officials. And the rest is actually about target populations. Uh, Max, lastly, if, if I may just interrupt you, uh, your audio is breaking up sometimes. Maybe if you could switch off your own video, it might be better with the bandwidth. Sorry for that. Yeah, is it better now? 
Um, For now, it seems to be working. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, uh, lastly, this like encyclopedia of uh, decision making uh, support addresses many possible solutions to improve decision making, but is actually not taking any behavioral lens uh, to understand decisions and provide uh, support to uh, policymakers in light of our understanding of, of human behavior. So reframing evidence-based decision making as a behavioral question can seem fairly obvious, um, but in fact, the current resources barely address the question in this way. Um, so what I will do is um, I will um, present um, three parts. First, I will cover what we know about decision making in policy. Then I will briefly present what works uh, to improve evidence-based uh, decision making. And then I will uh, introduce you to a checklist to improve your daily uh, decisions. So first, what do we know about decision making in policy? The first question is, who are decision makers? Who make decisions? So we actually interviewed a dozen um, of policy actors. And actually, none of them sees themselves as the ultimate decision maker. Instead, it, it seems that everyone actually makes decisions. Everyone makes decisions daily. Um, and that all of these micro decisions seem to then get aggregated in like group decisions at the, a team level or institutional level. So essentially, everyone is a decision maker, myself included and yourself in included. Particularly in policy um, and in international policy, there are two challenges uh, that make decision making difficult. One is uncertainty, the fact that we do not know what the best decision is. This is often due to uh, complexity um, or to political dynamics. And a second challenge is information overload. The fact that there is more information out there than we can actually process, either that we have the time to process or that we can cognitively um, process. The key challenge here is that we are often faced with both constraints at the same time. We both constrain with uncertainty and information overload, which means that we don't know what the best solution is. And at the same time, there's too much to know about. And as a result, decision making is um, a little bit like archery. Um, we need to aim fast. Uh, we need to make decisions because targets are actually moving. We do not have the time to process all of the information. And we need to adapt to our environment. We need to adapt to the wind, to the light, and so on. And um, this is kind of like an adaptive um, uh, skill that we need to build as decision makers. And that is actually not that easy. Um, but that kind of like begs the question of what do we know about how we do this archery, archery? How do we actually make decisions? And here we need to step back to understand that, in fact, our brains have evolved over millennia in extremely different contexts than the ones that we have today. Over millennia, our brains have uh, focused on um, survival and on solving tasks that were actually very close to us and uh, much more simple um, than the ones that we have today. But since the Anthropocene, we have, as humans, managed to change and transform our environment at an extremely large scale and extremely um, high intense uh, speed. Which, mean, which means that in a few decades, um, we completely change our environment, which means that we also change the decision-making challenge we need to solve. And we essentially need to uh, make these difficult decisions with the brains that our ancestors also had um, million years ago. And this is typically like an example where like in COVID-19 decision-making, we struggle making sense of uh, exponential curves. We struggle making sense of uh, governing systems with multiple objectives, such as uh, reducing caseload, but also protecting the economy or using uh, COVID-19 as an opportunity to uh, transform uh, societies. And there's essentially something fundamentally universal about uh, decision-making and behavior is that we all have an extremely similar brain with slight differences, yes, but in the end, we, we didn't have yet the time to change what has evolved over millennia. And therefore, we're all kind of similar on this front. But the problem is that we are changing our environment extremely fast, and therefore, we need to adapt. And this adaptation is extremely important in policy and in practice because of the high stakes of our decisions. This raises the question of, but how do we actually adapt? What do we know about behavior and, and decision making? So first, there's one thing is that we tend to be overconfident. This has advantages and downsides. Um, the advantage is that 
our, our confidence allows us to make decisions uh, even though there's uncertainty, even though we don't know what the best decision is. Um, the downside is that our confidence leads us to dismiss the views of other people, leads us to um, privilege only information that confirms our pre-established beliefs. Another point is that we think a lot by analogy. Uh, we rely on our past experiences to make sense of the future and make, anticipate uh, future outcomes. This is great because it allows us to build from experience and actually act quite fast uh, with respect to the future. But the problem is that the way we do this often is based a lot on uh, similarities. We look for similarities between the past and the future, while the future might actually be extremely different from the past, and therefore we might neglect future risks or different uh, types of scenarios. Another point is that we follow our intuition. Our intuition is actually an extremely good synthesizer and is actually very performant in complex envi environment. It allows us to act very fast. The problem is that our intuition is not extremely good at um, evaluating the consequences of extremely large problems, such as COVID-19 or climate change. Our brain struggles making sense of uh, large problems at this scale. Another point is that we also as humans tend to avoid making value trade-offs, which means that we often uh, take problems and we divide them into uh, small technical parts, um, which is good because that allows us to solve them. But the problem is that we also tend to privilege single value systems and we dismiss the views of other groups or smaller groups uh, whose values and, and beliefs also matter. Um, but that is something we do to like, solve problems um, problems and, and make progress uh, faster. As humans, we are also subject to how information is presented to us, how information is framed, uh, which is um, good because that allows us to navigate information overload depending on how information is framed. The only problem is that bad information can be very well presented, which can trick us into consuming fake news or very bad evidence. And we're also driven by our emotions. Our emotions are an extremely strong driver of commitment and engagement and action. And for example, when we feel um, fear and then hope, we are often triggered to commit and to act. And this is extremely good because that drives people to actually act in the world. The only problem is that the way we feel emotions is often subject to how information is presented, which means that there might be groups that we disagree with that present information in a certain way that trigger emotions in us and get us to act in ways that we actually do not intend to. Lastly, when we make decisions in groups, because often we are not alone, we make decisions in groups, we can be better or worse. Um, group decision making is actually an extremely valuable way to pull in different types of information, to build from different perspectives, um, and to avoid the different mistakes I outlined. But the problem is that in groups, when there are information asymmetries, so when your group members do not have the same information or have an equal amount of information, they tend to avoid voicing out this information. They tend to not share this information in order to preserve the consensus of the group, even when they disagree with this consensus. And that can lead to worse uh, decisions. So in summary, what do we need to do? We, we need to leverage our efficiencies and, and group advantages. We need to leverage the fact that we as humans, we are quite fast at making decisions and together in groups, we can actually make better decisions. But at the same time, we need to also actively work on preventing cognitive mistakes, uh, on spotting errors, and also on trying to make groups as good as possible and to avoid group uh, biases if possible. The question is, how can we actually do this? Uh, and that leads me to my second point, what works to actually improve evidence-based decision-making? And I will focus on two solutions. Um, there are many more that, that you can explore. The first one is what we call analogical training. Um, analogical training is the process of simulating future scenarios uh, in a room, um, either uh, physically uh, with people in the room or, or, or digitally or virtually. And the idea here is to rely on the fact that we think a lot by analogies. The problem is that if we think about the future, there might be things that happen, risks that manifest, that actually never happened before, for which we do not have experience, for which we do not have analogies and associations and reflexes and so on. 
And here, the idea is to essentially simulate uh, scenarios, uh, embed people in tabletop exercises to then build associations and analogies with possible future scenarios before they happen. An example of that is a tabletop exercise that we are running, which is on engineer pandemics. Um, so here, the focus is that we run a tabletop exercise where a pandemic happens, and then the audience basically has to react um, to the pandemic and to the cascade of events and has to communicate uh, with the group on, on, on how to decide how to act. And this is valuable because we haven't experienced engineered pandemics yet, but the risk actually exists. Um, and therefore, we cannot wait for pandemic engineered pandemics to happen to actually start building experience and analogies. We need to start earlier than this. And this is where like tabletop, ex tabletop exercises and simulations can be extremely valuable. And one of our interviewees actually said that the tabletop exercise allows to get people on the same way, on the same wavelength and to think long term. And that switching roles actually kicked people out of the usual frame. So that means that we can get people to step back and actually reflect on their own decision making and how to kind of think about the future and how to think about decision making. Another um, possible like uh, solution is a group decision making training, which um, ha would be would have at least two kind of components. One is uh, facilitation. So we know that group decisions are highly dependent on the way they are structured and facilitated. So we can train people to facilitate uh, these discussions. And we can also train people to communicate information and to find compromises more proactively um, in teams or in groups of stakeholders and so on. And one example of that is a training we run, which is on complex prioritization uh, in groups where we teach a technique called multi-criteria decision analysis, where we encourage people to identify their, their goals, find where they conflict, identify the decision options, and then see where uh, these goals and, uh, and options actually uh, fit with each other to allow a group basically to converge towards um, a similar understanding of uh, prioritization of a problem and so on. And so we ran this training and one piece of feedback was MCDA, so multi criteria decision analysis, actually creates miracles. Um, we succeeded at aligning our en entire strategic team behind the same vision. It is powerful. And here the point is, is not to give people like a, si a silver bullet uh, to make better decisions or pieces of information, but more to equip people with a process that they can implement within the team and then boost basically uh, the individuals and, and the team at large. And that leads me to a checklist to guide your daily decisions. Uh, because what I covered until now might be new, might be a lot to remember. And uh, remember, we still have this pile of uh, briefs and reports and papers to consume and process. So we don't necessarily have the time to think um, about our decision making in addition to, to all of what we need to do. So here's a basically a checklist of questions that you can ask yourself when you make decisions. Um, and the checklist is actually structured in this way. First, try to work on spotting mistakes. You can ask yourself the following questions. One is, am I neglecting the scope of some problems? And should I adjust my priorities? Uh, am I actually not working on what matters most? And ask yourself that. You can ask yourself, am I selecting information that only confirms uh, my views? And should I seek uh, more counter arguments? You can ask yourself, am I making other mistakes in judging information? Am I like highly subject to how some pieces of information was framed? Um, can, I, can I correct uh, for this? Second, try to leverage groups, whether it is the group of stakeholders you work with or the team that you work with. Um, you can ask yourself, what kind of information can I leverage from my group? Uh, you can ask yourself, what does the wisdom of the crowd actually tell me? Like, what, like the average basically says on what the decision should be. Um, ask yourself, do the members um, of my team, of my group have equal amount of information? Is there like a risk of information asymmetries? Is there a risk of groupthink? And then you can basically um, ask yourself, can I correct for this? Um, can I make sure that we do not go with a consensus that in, in the end people do not agree with? Thirdly, try to use like a minimal version of multi-criteria decision analysis. Um, so you can ask yourself, do I have competing goals and limited resources? Do I have conflicting goals, like different objectives that are all valuable, but they, 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 they involve trade-offs? 
um, ask yourself what are my options and, and how do they trade off against, against each other? And ask yourself, can I find synergies between uh, these different options? And can I find knowledge gaps um, to make uh, a better prioritization? Um, sometimes we end up being ready to make a decision and we make it. And before we do that, there's something valuable to do is to do a quick pre-mortem, which you can do individually or in groups. Um, you can basically ask yourself, I'm ready to make a decision. Would I be surprised if the decision actually failed? And you can try to use your imagination or your groups or um, external people to, to imagine how the decision could actually fail. And then you can work on improving your decision until you're extremely surprised by the decision being a failure. And this is something where you would try to rely on your intuition um, to check whether you're surprised about failure. And if you're extremely surprised uh, by failure, then that means uh, your decision is probably quite good. I realize that all of this can be maybe a lot to remember, a lot to consider. The good news is that you don't need to remember all of this. Uh, we actually packaged all of this information into like a very short guide on decision making uh, on wicked problems, uh, which you can actually download in the chat box. And you can just use this as a set of reminders, a checklist for when you make uh, difficult uh, decisions. And you can share this with your colleagues such that they have the same kind of references. So my point here is that the actions we, we take today actually have um, direct um, consequences on the future. And we want to do a good job at this. And for this, science is extremely valuable. Science, scientific evidence, data can actually inform our judgment. Inevitably, science leads to the production of papers, to the production of policy briefs and, and reports and so on. Basically, this pile of paper that we need to consume. But this pile of paper doesn't directly translate into your decisions. And therefore, we need science policy interfaces for that. And one type of science policy interface is actually ourselves, is actually our brains and our behaviors because we do process information ourselves. And, and I hope that with this presentation, I kind of like reframe the question of evidence-based policymaking as something that is a bit more personal and focused on groups where you don't necessarily need to seek out a lot of information and consume a lot, but rather watch out, watch out how do you consume it um, what guides uh, your behavior and decision making and what guides others uh, in your groups. And if you want to collaborate on this, please reach out. Uh, we're happy to run training programs or talk to you uh, about it. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to engaging um, in, the, in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Thanks for this deep dive into the, the behavioral dynamics uh, and making us aware of, of tools that exist to bring sort of empowerment in how we make uh, critical decisions. So thanks a lot for that. Um, we are actually getting to the end of our airtime for today. Um, it's been a fascinating set of presentations. I hope you found them uh, as use useful as I did. Um, they demonstrated practical, very diverse and compelling tools and approaches uh, to support data and evidence-driven decisions uh, to build forward better towards 2030. Uh, and I felt a real commonality across the presentations as well to push us to think outside the box and, and to shift the way we usually make decisions. And I think that was really something uh, I found across uh, all the presentations. So uh, thank you to all the speakers, uh, to the co-organizers of this event. Uh, thanks uh, to you all in the audience for your active participation uh, as well. Uh, and uh, well, until next time and take care. Bye.